Today we're here with Dr. Jonathan Kamak, who is our extension livestock entomologist, and we're talking ticks. It is midsummer. We're in the thick of it, and we're always worried about ticks and the hazard of them going when we go outside. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of the habitat that maybe we might be exposed to them in? Sure. So, you know, in a, a gardening, like, you know, backyard type situation, you know, we want to think about the areas that are going to be protected and safe for the ticks. Okay. Um, and ticks are spending about 90% of their life cycle off of whatever that host animal is that they're feeding on, whether that's a, a you know, a rodent, a bird, a dog, a cat, a cow, okay. a deer, you know, they're spending most of their time kind of in um, the environment hanging out. Okay. And a perfect environment would be like what we have over here behind us, this leaf litter. So um, when they, after they take a blood meal, they drop off of that host animal. That way they can digest that blood meal and then molt to their next life stage and they have to do that somewhere safe and protected. Okay. And beneath that leaf litter provides that perfect environment for them to be protected, but also have high enough humidity to not you know, die from the elements. Okay, so they need some shelter and not yeah. be exposed to the hot sun, right. right? So how often do they sort of go through that cycle of dropping off or how many hosts do they look for in their lifetime? So a lot of the ticks that we have in Oklahoma are what we would call three host ticks. Okay. And so that means over the course of their life, they're going to feed on three different host animals. Typically they get bigger with each life stage. So a larval tick we might see on, you know, a, a rodent, um, a nymphal tick we might see on something a little bigger, maybe a dog or a raccoon, and then adult is going to be on a deer, a cow, a person, you know, okay. re really whatever kind of, you know, big animal they can come into contact um, in the environment. Okay. Kind of our two uh, main problems that we're going to have during the summer across most of the state are going to be Lone Star ticks and American dog ticks. Uh, so our Lone Star ticks are, are the ones that have that bright white spot right in the middle of their back. They're the one that, you know, most Oklahomans are probably familiar with. Mm -hmm. And that's really our biggest problem from a, a kind of a human health perspective. There are a number of pathogens that uh, uh, we can contract by uh, being bitten by one of those ticks. So you want to be vigilant and making sure you're protecting yourself from them. Okay, so speaking of pathogens, mm -hmm. we have Lyme disease, we have um, Rocky Mountain fever, right? And then of course now alpha-gel is a big mm -hmm. one that we hear about. Can yep. you talk a little bit about any of those? Sure, so Lyme disease, um, we don't really have in Oklahoma. Okay. Um, so the ticks that are vectors of Lyme disease aren't feeding on the rodents um, at their early life stage, that larval stage, um, to, in order to be able to pick up the pathogens. So um, we have very, very few um, true documented cases of Lyme disease occurring in Oklahoma. Good which news, is, good yeah, news. It's great, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but we have a whole bunch of other things. Okay. So Lone Star <laughs> Ticks can uh, transmit a whole bunch of pathogens, um, you know, including uh, tularemia, ehrlichiosis, uh, southern tick-associated rash illness, and then even uh, they're also the causative agent of alpha-gal syndrome or that red meat allergy. Which we're hearing a lot more about, and that's not necessarily a disease, right? Tell me a little bit what you know of that. Yeah, it's uh, basically a, an allergic reaction that your body um, has after being bitten by a lone star tick. So most of the lone star ticks are feeding on other animals in the environment. Um, um, they're picking up, you know, things with their saliva that, you know, that comes into their body. And, and when they bite us, um, we have a reaction to that saliva. Uh -huh. And that reaction isn't immediate. It could be um, a month later. It could be even six or eight months later after our bodies had a chance to really kind of react to being bitten by that tick. And once you eat um, a mammalian-based product, whether that's a steak um, or some cheese or maybe even drink milk, if you're, you know, unlucky enough to get a really bad case of it, you're going to have um, an allergic reaction action, but it's not going to be a typical allergy, right? You're not going to sneeze. Um, very rarely um, do you see a rash, but most often what we see with alpha-gal are digestive issues. So you might have a steak for dinner and wake up in the middle of the night, you know, and think you've got food poisoning. And really what's happening is your body is attacking that protein. So of course we want to avoid ticks. So some of the areas we should stay out of you know, piled up leaves mm -hmm. and things like that. But what can we do to protect our body also? Right, there are a lot of things that we can do, you know, aside from staying out of the, you know, don't roll around in the leaves unless you have to. <laughs> um, but we can take a, a, a number of different approaches. Um, we can use chemical protection. So most sy synthetic pyrethroid products like a, a permethrin that you could go down to a sporting goods store or something and buy. Those are very, very good tick repellents. You could take the pants that you might want to be working in your garden in or something, um, lay them out, uh, follow the label directions, spray them really good with that product, allow them to dry and then you could wear those pants while you're working in the garden um, but you could also tuck your pants into your socks yeah. that way the ticks can't get inside your pants and okay. get on your skin but one of the best things we can do is after coming um, in from from being outside whether that's working in a, a garden or or hiking or, or even taking the dog for a walk is um, to do a tick check and that's to make sure um, that we don't have any hitchhikers that are going to feed on us and potentially you know give us a pathogen okay so say we do find a tick mm -hmm. 
you know, we don't know how long maybe it's been attached to us or something like that. What should one do? Yeah, remove it is our, our first step. Um, you don't want to burn it um, okay. with anything, whether that's a you know a cigarette lighter or something, okay. um, because if you burn them, it will actually cause them to you know kind of vomit or regurgitate. And if if they have a pathogen that you have not yet you know gotten from them, the chances that you're going to get it now have just increased because okay. you have forced it into your body. So um, the tick mouth parts, um, you want to grab those with a very fine pair of tweezers, really close to um, your skin where they've attached, and gently pull. That way you can dislodge those mouth parts and the tick. Okay. And then you'd want to keep it, maybe put it in a Ziploc bag or something and stick it in the freezer for the next couple of weeks because if you start to experience some symptoms, I um, you know, maybe you start to get a fever or, or something, you know, you want to have that tick, that way you can take it with you to the doctor and say, this is what bit me. Okay. So that the proper test can be run to determine what you may or may not have. I've, he I've heard you should scotch tape it to a calendar on the date you oh, find yeah. it. Oh yeah, you so could do that, yeah. So they can test for ticks potentially if you suspect there might be a tick problem that you're experiencing? Yes, yeah, some ticks can be tested, but it's also good to be able to identify what bit you. Okay. We know certain ticks are responsible for carrying certain pathogens. So, you know, we can use that to help support or maybe refine what you might be getting Just tested for. Just through IDing mm -hmm. the specific tick. Correct. Okay, well, thank you for this information. We appreciate you sharing it with us today. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this video as part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on the OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.